name is Christine and I am bringing to you a video filled with uh, some tutorials on some of the steps and skills required in order to complete these Bucilla kits. I've had a lot of requests to show how I do some of the stitches and assemble some of these kits. Now, um, I've compiled a video, but I'm just letting you know right off the bat that I'm just learning still along with you, but I thought I may as well just share what I do. And I'm guessing that even in a year or two from now, after doing more of these kits, I'm probably going to fine tune some of my skills. But as of right now, July 2023, uh, this is how I do things. And I hope that you find this helpful. All right, let's go ahead and get started and have fun with it. All right, so I already have my thread uh, on my needle. This is the applique needle that comes in the kit. It also comes with a beading needle, which is really thin and, and sharper. But when you do your embroidery, you want to use the applique needle. And I tied a little knot. I start from the left and work toward the right. So that's how I do it. So what you do is you just come up from the bottom so that your knot is in the back like that. You just go down, oh, I don't know, a tiny little bit, like a stitch length away, like so. And then you come up just right next to where you originally came up. Like so, and then you pull it. Then you have to make sure that the thread goes up to the top. You don't want it coming down this way because then that's a stem stitch. You want this to go up toward the top, so just kind of fling it up toward the top. Take another little, little tiny bite. You're stitching just like this, just a little ways away, and then come right back to where you your last stitch came out. Bring the thread up again. Do it again. Now we're on a straight line, so you can take a little bit bigger of stitches, but I highly recommend that when you go around a curve, like on a circle, that you take really tiny little stitches and you'll have a much better, smoother outline. And these threads, they do get tangled a lot, so you gotta kinda take it slow. You could use uh, some thread conditioner or beeswax if that helps, but I find if you just take it slow, it's usually fine. And then every so often I just kind of give it a tug in the direction I go, kind of hold on to it, and then that just kind of straightens up your line a little bit and makes it just lay a little better. And that's why you don't want to do the sequins at the beginning because what you end up with is getting your thread caught on all these sequins. So yes, you just gotta Make sure you don't get knotted. Ooh, this just really wants to knot here. There we go. And then when you get to the end, you just go straight down, right past the line right there, and then that's how you end off your... Oh, God. What did I do there? I got caught up in the loop there. Like so. Okay. There we go. And that's how the outline stitch looks. Now, because the next line is just very close to this one, I'll just turn it over like this. Don't know if that's recommended or not, but then I'm just going to come right up and just do the next line the same way. Just do that and go doop, 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 doop. And then you're done. So that's the outline stitch, and that's what most of the stitches that these kits call for. Sometimes they call for a back stitch, um, but the outline stitch is usually what you do. So now I'm going to show you when they call for an applique stitch what you're supposed to do. So we're going to go over and get these pieces here, and I'm going to show you um, how you applique two pieces together. Okay, I have decided it would probably be best to show you the applique stitch get all my little pieces out of the way here uh, on this piece right here because it's nice and big and bright so see how it has the little outlines there to show you that that goes there 
So you just place it on there and I feel like it's helpful to pin it, but I don't know. I'm not much of a pinner. I don't usually pin things, but I'll, for your sake, I'll go ahead and put a pin in this just to kind of keep it in. Uh, but I just kind of maneuver it as I go. Okay, so when you're appliquing one piece to another piece, what you do is just find a good place to start. If you're, if, this, if you're attaching something to a stuffed piece, you don't want to come all the way from the back. What you're going to want to do is come up from just right underneath that color. So we'll go ahead and do that because that's just a good habit to get into so that your knot is hidden there, just like that. Okay, then there's two ways of doing this. Now, I prefer, because I'm a cross-stitcher, so I'm used to kind of poking, stabbing, poking, stabbing. That, to me, is a motion that's very comfortable for me because that's how I cross-stitch. So a lot of times when I do these, if the back of the piece is going to be covered and it isn't going to show, then I will tend to just do my applique stitch by coming up and then going down right next to, this, right next to it like this, okay? So it's just, and you pull it kind of tight to snug, snugly pull it like that. Then I come up just a little ways away, like so, and it's all personal preference, how tight you, close you want your stitches to be. And then I'll come down again, because I feel like I have really good control over where, how my stitches, how close they are. And then when I go down, I just, I don't go too far out here. You kind of want to tuck your, your needle, your, I mean your needle under it just a little bit like that. And then you see how it's, it's almost doing just this very invisible, I mean, and you don't need to take a big stitch unless you like that look. Some people like the look of the, the bigger stitch. So, and then you just kind of pull it snugly as you go along. If you want to do it, what's called the sewing method, is you come up like that, and then instead of going all the way through, you just kind of go, you, you grab a little bit of the under piece and then come up so, so you're going to still go down like you would if you're going to go under the fabric, but then you, you don't go all the way through. You just kind of come up and where you want to come up. <laughs> it's very technical. Come up where you want to come up. But you see, you get the same look, but I feel like for me, my stitches don't look as even that way because I kind of don't feel like I don't have as much control over it. But you can really kind of get on a mode where you're just going, you know, down and under, down and under like that and you just don't need to grab big pieces of it. But it, it, it is a little faster that way, but I feel like, I mean, you can kind of see, I don't know. I feel like my stitches here I like better, <laughs> but it just depends. I switch, I swap back and forth between the two. So that's how you applique one piece of felt to another piece of felt. But now when you want to attach, like say a back of a, a front of a piece of a felt to a back piece of felt, and you need to go around the edge, then you do what's also called the applique stitch, but it's more kind of what I always grow up knowing as the, um, what's it called? Like a, a whip stitch. All right, so, well, since this one's needing to be whip stitched here, uh, I'll go ahead and show you how you would take two pieces and, and whip stitch them together right before stuffing them. So let me get my thread ready to go and I will show you that. I just realized that I can't really put these two pieces together just yet because I haven't done the sequence. So uh, since that part needs to be done first, I will show you that first. So sequence and beads are very easy. Let me grab it. For this tutorial, I'll just dump some on the table and show you. So it comes with the clear beads. So we're just gonna take a few, I mean, I'll just, Actually, I'll just throw them in the lid there, like so. Put some beads in there. Two, oh, two sequins, more than a few. I'm gonna move these out of the way before I dump them all over the place. You knot your fabric, you knot your thread on the other side, just like you always do, and you come up right there where the dot is with your thread. We are now using a beading needle and it's very tiny and very sharp and kind of hard to thread. And I know a lot of people like to use uh, two strands of embroidery floss for extra strength. And probably for a stocking, I would maybe do that or if, you're, if you sell these, but I don't know, for me, that's literally gonna just be hanging there doing nothing. So I think that it's fine to use one. So you come up with one strand of floss 
what you do is you grab a sequin like this and you want to make sure that the cupped side is facing up because that's where all the shine is from. So you want to come up from the back of the sequin so that the cup is up, okay? And then I just grab a bead right, right, right while I'm there. So you have a sequin and a bead in that order. And then you just slide it down so that it's right on there just like that. Okay, and then when you go down to secure it, you want to go not down through the bead again, but just through the hole on the sequin. And you just go right down like that. And then give it a good little snug pull. And that's that. Then I usually just go over, you can knot it. If you want to knot each the back of each one, you can. I, I should probably, but I don't. I just go right to the next one, especially if they're close. And then you just grab a sequin again, this time making sure that you grab it from you know the back side like that. Grab a bead. This looks really slow the way I'm doing it right now, but you get on a roll with it and you find your way. And then you just go right down next to it again, just like so. That's how you attach the sequins. Okay, I finished up uh, the sequins and I'm just going to turn it over and just, I usually just grab a little piece of felt and some thread on the way back, on the back side and do just a couple of knots like that to secure it. like so and let's hope that we don't get a big tangle good now since i already have blue floss threaded uh blue uh, yes embroidery floss threaded on my needle i'm just going to swap out my needles my needle to a uh, applique and then i'm going to go ahead and applique the front to the back did i mention before that you do the applique with one strand of matching embroidery floss. Okay, here I have the pieces. Then you gotta match it up just like that. You can pin it. I usually don't pin. I just kind of hold it and just kind of wing it like that. Okay, so if you uh, were just starting, you would wanna knot your floss and then come up from the inside just slightly in here like that, just like you would only just it would there would be a knot instead of already being attached like there just was uh, when, from doing the sequins. And then you're just gonna do a whip stitch while you hold these together. So I usually come so straight, even with the where I came up, I just go right into the back and then you, you just kind of come at an angle like this, okay? So you just come through the back and you don't take a very big stitch, okay? Just kind of like that. And then you pull it just like that. Okay, same thing, kind of come, you know, directly on the opposite side of where the thread came up, but then come up at an angle, just like that. So that you have a stitch. I'm holding this a little farther away from me than I usually do because I have this camera in my face, but you get the idea. You just kind of snugly Whip stitch it together. Now, when you get to where you have a color on 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 the front here, you don't want your your blue floss to come through there or your other colored floss to come through there. So what I do is when I come up from the back is I just try to grab right below, right behind that so that you, it's kind of hidden. And then you just keep doing that. It's actually quite easy. Just pinch it together and just keep grabbing and stitching and making sure you don't get caught on anything. You gotta watch the sequins and you just keep doing that. Grabbing, you know, once again from behind so that your blue doesn't show on the front. Now this piece needs to be stuffed. So I'm going to save a little opening at the end to put a little bit of stuffing in. So 
So see how it's kind of looking here? Okay, so I left it a little bit of an opening there that I'm going to add a little bit of stuffing to. So let me grab my stuffing. Okay, you don't need very much. And this is just, uh, I just get the polyester poly polyfill uh, that I get at uh, Walmart, the real in inexpensive stuff. And then I use, uh, you could use a chopstick. I like to use these little cuticle sticks and I just filed off uh, one edge of it, the pointy edge, and just kind of so I have a flat edge and I also have this. You can use whatever you want. There's a gazillion different things you can use to add stuffing. So this just, it happens to be the one that I like to use. So this is kind of a narrow little spot. So what a narrow little opening here. So I'm just going to get some little pieces of it and open it up just like that. And then, so I kind of have to get it started. Maybe it would be better to use a little bit thicker of a stick. So you just push it all the way down to the end. In hindsight, if I would have been thinking, I probably would have left an opening maybe right here as opposed to on an end, but it's all good. Let me just get some more down in there. Careful not to overstuff. So see, I can use like kind of this beveled edge here to kind of push it down that way. All right, I think we just need just a little bit more on that tip. It gets kind of hard to close if you add too much, so when you start to get toward the end there, just kind of grab it, push it in. I'm losing my light. It's late afternoon and it's cloudy here, so hopefully this is still showing up okay. Okay, I think that's good. Kind of maneuver it around in there a little bit. Then you just pick up where you left off, like so. You're always going to have these little fuzzies kind of sticking out, and you can kind of trim those off at the end. So then you just close it up by finishing it just like so. Sometimes I just use my needle to push some of those in. get to the end, just kind of take a little stitch and do a knot. Like so, and then I just Stick that in, come out somewhere over here like that. Trim it off, and then there we go. We have the thumb of the glove.
I thought that I would just on camera here show you how I'm going to stuff his face. This is just uh, the polyfill that I get at Walmart. Um, it shows a picture of a doll on the front. And so far, until I find something better, that's what I've been using. Now, I don't want to stuff the face too much. So I think just a little bit of padding right there. And then I like to just take the tool, kind of. Make sure it goes to the edges. Like that. And then I'm going to take my needle. I'm going to do this off camera, but I'm going to go ahead and finish stitching the bottom right there. When it's flat, you know, that's how it looks when it comes on the felt and you have to cut it all out around. and. It seems like the obvious thing that you do is start from the middle, and I kept fiddling with it to start from the middle, and it just wasn't looking right. Well, then after I Googled it, I realized that what you're actually supposed to do is start from the end, the, the outside end. So you just start like this, and it takes a bit um, just to kind of figure out, maybe rolling it a couple of times to see how it looks, how it's supposed to look. You just kind of do this and you roll it around. Now I would probably tack it as I go. Like you can take a few stitches, try to keep the bottom kind of flat, but I know I had to do it a few times to get it to look good. But you see how it's starting to look like a rose? Kind of push that bottom up in there like that. Wrap it around. And then when you get the way, I try to do it like if, if you start to see that the, the petals are lining up with each other, you know, you can start again and make it so that each time they go around, they're more, um, you know, like offset. Because see, they're starting to kind of match up a little bit too much there. But you play around with it as best you can. And then when you get all the way down to the bottom, or to the end, not the bottom, there's this little kind of flap right here that's supposed to go, I guess, along the bottom of it there, like that. I'm sorry, I'm not in... I'm not in camera, but this little flap right here just goes kind of flat against the bottom. And then you just do what you can to pin it together. And then you have this cute little rose. I think it's adorable. That actually looks pretty good. I'm just going to pin that and hold it. Matter of fact, I'm going to just stick the pin down in there like this. Right there. All right, you, get, you get the gist. That's how the little, little flower looks. So cute. All right, hello again, I'm back, it's the next day. And since I was losing my light yesterday, I decided to start a little bit earlier today, where there's a little bit more sunlight coming into my room. And I'm going to show you how to do one of these little flowers right here. I guess these are the same, but um, yeah, we're going to build that flower right there. We're going to attempt to, uh, because I have actually never, done one of these flowers from start to finish in which it is um, tacked with thread. <laughs> now I think in a previous video, I, the video that I did where I was working on the Valentine Love in the Air wreath, there is a similar flower in that kit that is a rose. Um, and they're both assembled the same way. So I did show how to do that in embedded in that video somewhere it's part one um, but I'm just going to go ahead and show you how you do all of these different uh, flowers that come in these kits so the key to them is you don't start winding them from the middle like you might think 
You might think that because when you cut them out, this is how they look. And you might think that you start in the center. As a matter of fact, I think the instructions even say start in the center and do like this rolling up thing. But I have discovered from several sources on the internet that it is best to start on the outside edge and start rolling. So let's do that. Okay, so let's just roll this up and see how it turns out. Now, it's probably wise to... So I have rolled these up before and it looks fine, but I, I'm never quite sure how you're supposed to tack it with thread. So we're doing this together for the first time and let's see how it works out. So let's just roll this up, keeping that edge even, just like that. By the way, did you notice uh, I don't have nail polish on today? When I was editing yesterday's video, I realized how undesirable my nail polish has been uh, starting to look recently. Well, okay, I didn't realize it until I had an up-close video of it, and then I was like, ooh, that's bad. I need a manicure. So anyway, I removed my nail polish, and I'm not so sure that my unpolished nails look much better. But we're going with it. Is the season for gardening, working outside? Okay, I wasn't really gardening. I was I've been pulling a lot of weeds, so. Okay, so now when you get to the end here, you'll notice that they usually have this little flap here that you can kind of cover the bottom with, like so. But this is where I'm, I'm going to just try to tack it together. Like I said, we're doing this together for the first time. So I have knotted some thread, and I'm going to hide my knot. Watch this whole thing just fall apart on me. Okay. Now I think what I'm going to do, if you can even see, hopefully I'm in frame. So I just tucked my little knot under there. And now I'm just going to stick this through uh, all the way to the other side, like so, and hope that I grabbed it. I probably didn't grab them all, so I'm going to just go back and forth. What? Hmm, did I just pull my knot through? What is this? Okay. Yes, I've got a nice knot in my thread. Pardon me while I get rid of that little knot. Okay. There we go. I'm starting to lose my center here, so let me push that down. This is real life, people. Me doing this for the first time. Not even sure what I'm doing. Okay, you know what? I feel like I did not get that center tacked, so we're just gonna... I'm just gonna pull the thread up through the center like so. And then I'm gonna go right back down through the center, and this time I'm gonna grab that little bottom cover. Like that. And then... Maybe I'll do that again. Kind of come up through the center again. I'm just kind of making sure I'm going through some of those layers of felt. And I'm going to go right back down into the center again, like so. Making sure it doesn't get caught on anything. that and just to be secure again I think I'm gonna go through all the layers again like so and then again they just say tack it with a few strands of floss Okay, and then I'm going to come back down through the middle. So I'm just kind of randomly going in here. Now, I'm going to give all of these a good tug. And it seems to me like they're all snug as a bug. So I think I think we, we have a successful flower. What do you say? <laughs> all right. 
and I'm sure that when I do this again a second time I'll even do it much better but I think that's pretty good and it has the string on the back there all ready to attach so there we go cute little flower cute little felt flower all right uh, I may also show how to do some satin stitching in this video um, but be forewarned I am not very good at it but I will attempt it just so that you can see even when you're not good at it you can fiddle with it enough and make it look good so let me go find a piece of, of felt that I can show you how to satin stitch I'm back I went and grabbed a piece of felt to do some satin stitching on because I noticed that this watering can right here has some little satin stitched circles and circles are probably the hardest thing to satin stitch it's really hard to get them to look round so <laughs> we're, we're gonna we're gonna give it uh, some good effort here and this is the piece of felt that I'm going to satin stitch on so it calls for some turquoise uh, two strands of turquoise let me go ahead and get it knotted up all right so what I have found oh so you want to cover the black outline so I'm going to come up just on the outside of that black outline just like so and then I'm going to lay my floss I try to keep it as untwisted as possible we're just going to go down on the other side of that to get our first strand right there it already has a little bit of a twist in it I find it's you know it just looks a little better if there's not a twist in it but I think it's inevitably going to get twisted so you do your first stitch in the center like that then see this is the tricky part is you got to come up very very close to it and it's hard to do so I think what I like to do is I'm gonna just do kind of a first go round with my stitches as close as I can and then do a second go round where I sort of fill in the gaps and I find that that works out better because this is definitely one of those embroidery stitches that looks better with practice so you're just gonna go right on the outside see there's like kind of a, a good size gap there which is okay because we're just kind of going with this first pass and of course I don't I'm, when I do it in front of the camera I can't really keep it up close to my face so none of my stitches embroidery stitches ever look all that good when I'm when I'm filming myself because I can't uh, hold it right up to my face like I normally do but there's a hack to make your satin stitching look better when you're done and I will show you that so you can kind of see that I did that and I'm going to just do one tiny other little one right there you don't want to pull these super tight either you just want to kind of get them to lay smooth like that and then I'm going to go backwards again it is really hard to do this when it's not in front of my face like so you have to take your time doing satin stitching it, it's not a quick stitch and you can kind of just examine it now I think that I've read that when you do satin stitch you always need to kind of keep going in a loop like always come up on the same side and go down so you don't want to um, you know come up I mean see how I'm always coming from this side going down then this side going down this side going down I think I saw somewhere online that that's the the better way to do it uh, I could be wrong about that I am not an expert okay so it's looking okay I'm not covering the black line quite as much as I want to so I'm gonna go a little bit farther on the outside like so okay that's kind of half of it so far so let's let's go do the other half I'm going to turn it just the other way you gotta just kind of hold it to whatever feels good for you here
them back in the center again. I'm trying to get, there's a little gap there. I'm trying to fill in. I'm twisting my thread a little bit. Like that. Wow, look at how that's looking so far. Pretty good. So, I could probably stop there, but, you know, you can keep going over it to smooth it out a little bit. Okay, there we go. That's a circle. Now, I was going to show you, you could stop there, and that's perfectly fine because, you know, you can actually see, even on this picture here, that, you know, you can see a little bit of the black outline. And, you know, satin stitching is supposed to look kind of like a handmade stitch, so that looks pretty cute. But it's, notice how mine's kind of oblong a little bit? It's really hard to make it round. So, what I was going to tell you is you could go back afterwards and you can do like an outline stitch around the outside edge of this to sort of round it up a little bit so let's try that I have done that before where it actually looks worse so so the outline stitch was what I showed in the previous video where you just take you know the tiny little stitches I was showing you some pretty big stitches when I was demonstrating it but in reality when you do the outline stitch you want to take small stitches. Okay, now when I puff it out and stretch it, it doesn't look too bad. So there we go. So what did you like better, before the outline or after the outline? I kind of like the, the finished look of the outline. But as you get better with satin stitching, you know, these will lay a little bit smoother. You know, you gotta, there's a lot to, to pl at play there because you gotta get your, learn to get your tension right and that kind of stuff. But you can kind of comb it afterwards Anyway, not the most perfect satin stitching, but it's um, definitely, uh, it's a keeper. And I'm sure by the time I do all these round circles, they'll look really good toward the end. Uh, looks like there's some Lazy Daisy stitches that are called for right here. So let me go change my floss and I'll show you how to do a Lazy Daisy stitch too. Okay, you may have noticed a little bit of a light change because it's actually the next day. I went to edit my footage yesterday and when I was doing my lazy daisies, my hand kept getting in the way and I was a little bit off frame and the whole thing was kind of a mess and not really pleasing to watch. So here I am the next day and I'm going to do the lazy daisy stitch take two and then I will insert it into yesterday's footage because the rest of that one seemed to be okay. Okay, so I have my two strands of floss that it calls for to do these lazy daisies. Um, you always need to look to see how many strands they want you to use in this particular time. In this kit, they want me to use two strands. So I have my little knot. And in order to do a lazy daisy stitch, you... Okay, this a lazy daisy stitch, the, these little lazy daisy flowers consist of four lazy daisy stitches. So the first stitch that you do is a lazy daisy and then you do four of them to create the flower, if that makes sense. And what you do is you come up from the center like this and the whole premise is what you're going to do is you're going to kind of make a loop. You're going to make the petal uh, form and then you're going to tack it down. So 
you're going to first make the loop by going down the same hole that you came up with, that you came up through, just like that. And before you pull it all the way, so you can kind of see that you're forming a little petal there, then you want to come up at the tip of the petal, just inside the black line, like that. Hopefully that's showing up. And you want to go in the center of the loop that you just made, because then you're going to pull it, not too tight, but just kind of so it covers the black line like that. And you want you don't want to pull it too tight because then you lose the petal formation of it. After you get that, then you can see that the next step to do is to tack it down by going right on the outside of it and doing a little tacking stitch just like that. And then there you have your first petal of your little Lazy Daisy flower. And then you repeat that over and over again four times. So then you're going to come right back up into the middle again. And you're going to go, just hold that out of the way, go back down the center, just like that, so that you form this loop. So the loop's going to go just like that. And then you come up right on the inside of that black line and pull until you get a nice shaped petal, just like that. Don't pull too tight, and then you're going to tack it down. Just like that. Now you've got two petals. And if it's a little uneven like that, you just tug it a little, even it out. All right, and then one more time, two more times actually. So turn it, and you see come up, go back down the same hole in the center, make a loop to just get that out of the way so you could see where you're coming up right there on the inside of the black line. Pull it like that. Okay. Sometimes these don't cover up the black lines all that well because they sort of have a mind of their own, <laughs> these little loops, but you can just kind of get it you know, looking the best you can. I've just learned to live with some of these, some of, on some of these uh, stitches you do, you just, you're going to see the black underneath it, and it's just, I've just learned to live with it. You'll drive yourself crazy if you always try to hide all of the black lines on these kits. It's part of the charm, right? Make a little loop like that. Come up. Just like that. And go back down. And there you have a little lazy daisy stitch. Lazy daisy flower. Then you just turn it over and I just do a little bit of a, a little uh, knot on the back. So you could do a double knot, which that's where you go through the loop and then you go through the loop again like that. And every time I do those, they it gets caught and gets all knotted up. So I usually just do the single knot twice. <laughs> Works out better for me. I've never mastered the, the double loop. And then because I tied a knot there, I you could just clip your thread and start again. But if it's not very far away, I'll just go right over to the next one and do it again. But I have a very short piece of floss here, so I probably will cut that off and just get a new piece of floss that's longer and then do the rest of these. But I hope that clears that up and you can see how uh, easy those are to do and really fun. Okay, now I'm going to get, go back to yesterday's video. Oh, but first, while I was uh, went downstairs to get this and take out the stitches I did yesterday so that I could show them again, I also realized that this kit has in it a bow. Let me go grab the piece of paper that shows what it looks like. Okay, so this here, you can see right here where my thumb is, that is what the uh, bow is going to look like on the flower basket, which I haven't gotten to that, that part of the kit yet. But uh, I'm going to show you, it's real easy to assemble. The instructions actually are very easy because it shows you right on here that you just fold the two sides in and then you fold the middle over and tack it. So it's probably not anything I even really need to show you because it's pretty easy to do, but we'll just add it to this video, this tips and tricks video. 
this is what it looks like when you cut it out. Now I have not done the embroidery or the sequins on this, so I'm not going to officially tack it yet because I want it laying flat. You obviously want to have that part done first. Uh, and I just realized I only have part of the bow. Oh, hold on, let me go get the rest. Okay, here's the other part of the bow. All right, so it's very easy what you do, just like the instruction said, you're going to, after you be a embroidery and sequin, you're just going to fold that back piece like that. Then you're gonna take this one, because they have these little tabs on them there. And then you're gonna take that, and fold it so they're stacked on top. And then you're going to take this piece, oops, you wanna wrap it around the front of the bow, like that, and then around the back. And then you're gonna tack it. Um, you know what, I'll just use this pink floss now because I'm not gonna keep this. This is just temporary anyway because I have to, like I said, take it apart. But when you do tack it, you don't wanna come all the way through to the front because then you'll see your little stitch. So I'll just come sort of at an angle like that. And then go back under there again and go through the back side like that so that your little tacking stitch gets hidden. And then, because you already have some floss on the back, that's when you can then grab this piece and set it back here. Actually, you're just gonna come through like that. And then you're just gonna Grab a couple stitches on the back of it like that to tack it. I'm not gonna to do too many, because like I said, I need to take this apart again and do the beads and sequins. But then there you have your little bow. Am I, am I in frame? Yeah, there we go. And then if you just, uh, you would obviously use red floss, matching floss, not the pink like I did here, but then this little strand that you have left over is what you then could tack it to, whatever you're gonna tack it to on the um, project. So there we go, cute little bow. And I would probably do a few more stitches than just those three I did, just to tack it nice and good. And uh, that's it. Okay, I got another piece of floss loaded up and ready to go. And to do a back stitch, sometimes it calls for a back stitch instead of an outline stitch, and that's really easy. You just take a, one stitch like this, and then you come up just a little bit farther away, like so, and go down where you came up, like this. That's the poke and stab method of doing it, the way I prefer. And then if you wanna do like the sewing method of it, you would just, let's see, how would you do that? I think you hold it this like this and you go kind of like you're doing that the outline stitch and then just I never my stitches never look quite as good doing it that way I keep saying that that's why I don't do that so anyway you get the idea that's how it is. But I kind of just try, try to remember it as just, you know, you take one step forward and then you go back to where you came up, right next to it, like that. Then you come a stitch length ahead, like this, and you just follow your line and come back down, like that. And that's how you do a back stitch. Okay, so let's go ahead. I just uh, got a uh, piece of turquoise or teal floss loaded up it has a knot on it and we're going to uh, i'm going to show you how to do the chain stitch which is just a bunch of lazy daisies like i just showed you all lined up in a row so you do the same thing you come up and then you hold your floss to the side like that then you're going to go down next to the same hole and you're going to go about one stitch length just like this making sure that you catch 
the floss in a loop like that. You'll, it'll, it'll come clearer as I do more of them, but that's just how you get it started. So you do your first one just like that. Okay, then hold the floss, go down, right by where you came up, do another stitch like so. So see how you have like two lazy daisies there? I like to untwist my floss a little bit there, hold it again, come down next to that one, take another stitch. So the trick with this and how, why you get better as you go along is because you can start you start uh, making your stitches very uniform in size. So there's three of them. This is a really fun stitch to do. And once again, you get better with practice. Sometimes they're all willy-nilly in their sizes when you first get started, just like that. So there you go. That's what the chain stitch looks like. And then when you're done, you just go down one Take one more tacking stitch right at the end, just like that, and then there you have your chain stitch. I think that's it. The back stitch, the outline stitch, and the chain stitch are the only ones I think that I've... Oh, and the lazy daisy. Oh, you know what? Let's show you how to do a French knot while we're here. Okay, so French knots, I think there's a lot of people that don't like them but they're they're really not that difficult to do if you keep a couple of things in mind so what I like to do so I would come up and I find it works best if I set this down hopefully I won't go out of focus set my piece down just like that okay on the table then you have your your needle in one hand then you're gonna take this floss and you're just gonna wrap it around twice just like that and then as you kind of lay, like I said, it's better on a table, then you just go down very close to where you came up. And then I like to just kind of hold that floss in place as I pull this through. Now you don't want it to be too tight because you need to pull the, the needle through. And then you just go real slow and you'll see if you don't get a knot and you pull this through. And right when you get toward the, the end, you just let it go just like that. And there you have your French knot. And they're, they're not all going to turn out perfect. They're all going to have their own mind of their own. But it's, it's really simple. You just do that. Set it down. I just go wrap, wrap. And then while I'm still holding a little bit of tension, I just put the needle right down by it like that. Pick this up again. Hold it taut, just like that. Take it, pull it through, and when you get right to the end, just slowly do it. And there you have another French knot. And they just take practice. So just do a lot of them, and you'll get good at it. All these stitches you'll get good at. Okay, I knew that there would be one more thing that I wanted to show you. But I wanted to mention in this video one of the things that you will need to know how to do especially if you do the ornaments are is this twisted cord can you see how I have that little twisted cord there because that's how you hang them and you make it with floss and I would show you how to do that but instead I've got something better for you I'm going to link below um, a tutorial by the wonderful Bonna Pfeiffer also known as the twisted stitcher and she does the most amazing tutorial on all things cording. <laughs> so I, instead of attempting to uh, show you how I do cording, she does a much better job and I have to refer to her video quite often when I haven't done it in a while. She shows how to make two colored cording and all just different kinds. So I'm gonna link her video below to show you how to do that twisted cording. But if you don't feel like making your own cording, you can always just buy some cording at the fabric store and um, not make your own, but it is fun to make your own because then you can use the floss that comes in the kit. So be sure to check out that link below and uh, learn all about making your own cording. As I was working on my butterfly, 
I came across a technique that they called for called a beaded outline or bead outline and this is what Vucilla has used uh, in a kit I used uh, that I did in the past and so every once in a while they call for this technique and this is what it looks like on paper. You can see that you string four beads on. So you, well, you come up from the bottom after you've not knotted your floss. Then you thread four beads and then you bring the needle straight down after that the fourth bead. Then you come back up in between the two middle. You come up in the middle between the, the second and third bead. Then you re-thread the needle. Or re, then you re-string the needle through the last two and then you repeat by putting four more beads on and you keep going along. So that's what the instructions look like. And now I'll show you what it looks like in action. All right, we grab four beads. Like so. Make sure they're nice and snug next to each other. Go down. You can see how I'm just going down right after that last one. Just like that. Then you come up right in between in the vicinity of the middle two. Rethread it through the last two. And grab four more. And repeat the process. And there you have it. Now when you cut these, it's real important that you try to cut all of the stamp off. And I find that that's kind of hard to do. Um, it takes practice and sometimes you have to go back. I find it easier even though I'm right-handed so I naturally want to cut this way, you know, I kind of want to cut around something that way. But I find that I do a better job cutting the stamp off if I keep the stamp over to the left side of the scissors, which feels a little bit awkward, but I can see, you know, a little bit more that I'm I'm actually cutting the stamp off. Can you see how it's like, I can see that it's being left behind. If I do it the other way, I almost always have stamp left over that I have to go and clean off. Now, this is all just, you know, it's just a minor inconvenience, but, <laughs> um, it is kind of a pain though when the stamp is left behind out. Even when I do it this way, I don't always do a, a perfect job and you kind of have to go back and clean it up. It's a little bit slow going, cutting these pieces out, trying to get the stamp off, but I kind of find it relaxing. Sometimes I just will go through, like I'll probably go through this evening and just cut all these pieces out because I really enjoy doing that part of it. So. Anyway, I'll go ahead and just finish doing this one. If you're not going to use these pieces right right away, you can just do this and leave the piece, uh, the number attached to it like that, like so. But I know very well where these pieces go in the owl, that they're the two parts, the two white parts that go on the eye. So I don't feel the need to keep the number there. But now, because I'm not holding these real close to me, because I'm filming, I did not do a real good job making that a smooth circle. But that's okay, because if I've learned anything, felt is very forgiving. And when you're appliquing this piece on, 
you know, all those little kind of edges and not round parts uh, just seem to kind of disappear when you do the applique. It's almost like working with clay, you know, felt can be very moldable. So I like that. So I'm not going to keep this number on and I am going to go ahead and just cut it the way I showed you that I don't like to cut because I almost always leave the stamp behind. But now you can see I did a pretty good job getting all of that edge off. So, all right, there we go. So you get your piece cut like this. What I'm going to do and what I have found works is that right from the get-go, you want to start, uh, you want to have the, the pipe cleaner in the felt when you start. That worked out better for me. Now I've already done all the leg. This is the last one I have to do. So I've had a little bit of practice so I can show you my technique. So let me grab my needle. You take one strand and you tie your little knot in the end, like so, like I have. And then what I was doing is just to get it started, you want to hide your knot on the inside like that. Okay, so then I want to sew, let me move my face here, taking just a little bit of a, a stitch. I want to close that, the top end of it. So I just, I'll show you a little bit closer of what I'm doing, but just to get it started. Now this is going to be covered by a shoe, so it doesn't really matter how this tip looks. So you just want to kind of get yourself started there like that. Okay, so now that we've got that going and I got to make sure I stay in focus, you're just going to take a little piece from the outside and I try to kind of, you know, not catch the, the pipe cleaner in there. And then you grab a little piece just Grab a little piece there. Make sure that stays there. As I go along, this will be a little more clear. It's kind of fiddly at the beginning, getting it started. But as you move along, just want to fold that over like that. Grab just a little piece. Can you see how I'm grabbing that there? And then grabbing another little piece here. Make sure that that, at the beginning, it always wants to get caught on the edge, like that. Oh, and you'll also notice they want you to do the sequins before you do this part. And I found that it's much easier to not have the sequins in your way and to do the sequins after. So I'm just grabbing the tiniest little bites from one side and one side, and you're just doing a whip stitch or an applique stitch, which I think they're pretty much the same. As you go, grabbing, grabbing. Straighten it as you go along. knot because the thread in the Bucilla kits is not ideal and I forgot to wax up condition my thread first which always helps okay so now that I've gone a little farther with it you can sort of see let me pull it. And you want to pull it nice and tight as you go, but not too tight because then your thread will break. I have found. So you can see ever so slightly a little bit of tiny of the white chenille stem, the furs showing through. So it would be, this would look even better if they were black. So use black. I think I might just go ahead and finish it off camera and then come back and show you what it looks like. So let me go do that and I'll be right back. Okay, I am really starting to lose my light fast here. I moved a little closer to the window. But I wanted to show you I have it all done, and once again, why you want to use the black instead of the white. And that's a little, that's a pretty fluffy little uh, pipe cleaner I was using there. 
Um, so that's it. It's really easy. That took about 10 minutes to do. Um, really simple to do. All right, so we're going to get into the next part of the video, which is the section in which I talk about some of the tools that I use, some of the tools that I have found to be helpful. Um, first of all, you need a pin cushion to store your little pins. And I usually like, you can use any pins you like. I'm not a big, I've said many times, I'm not a big pinner, but sometimes you do need to pin things uh, to hold them in place. But uh, this is always good to keep your applique and your um, beading needles in. So definitely good to have a pin cushion of some sort. All right, uh, what are some other things for stuffing? Adding the stuffing. Um, you could use any kind of stuffing you like. Everybody has a different preference of what they like to use. I've heard people use cotton balls. I personally just use the cheap polyfill that you can get at Walmart. Um, it's not my favorite. It's a bit uh, slippery and can be kind of difficult to work with, but uh, it, it's, it's kind of what I've been using on all my ornaments. And so I'm getting used to kind of learning the amount of fluff that I like. So I just use that. And it usually, when you buy a bag of that, it usually comes with a chopstick of some sort. So you could use the chopstick that comes with it. Now this one, I don't know, this one looks a little defective, but, uh, it comes usually with a chopstick, which is good, especially for bigger pieces. But for the smaller pieces, I like to use just a cuticle stick that you can buy. You can buy a, a whole set of them pretty cheap at Walmart. And I think I showed you earlier in the video that I filed the sharp point off of one of them and so that it has a flat tip on one side. And I really love to use this for smaller pieces. There's this tool I bought called That Purple Thing. You can get that, I think, on Amazon or at your craft store. Um, it can come in handy too. I don't use this a ton. Uh, I find that the wood with the polyfill that I use that the wood sticks to it a little better. So I find that this does actually, the wood sticks work a little better for me, but there is that purple thing that a lot of people love and use. So that's what I use for the stuffing of the polyfill. Uh, some other, oh, speaking of stuffing, it does for things like when you're um, stuffing legs or really skinny pieces, it's good to have some chenille stems, also known as pipe cleaners back in the day. And I only have white ones right now, but I would recommend getting them in several colors um, because they it's probably better to match the felt that you're using with a, with a matching color. So definitely get a pack of chenille stems to keep on hand for stuffing those tiny little skinny pieces. What else that's handy? If you do any of the ones with uh, the faces that require a little bit of blush, I just would go to the store and get yourself some pink blush. Uh, I got this at Walgreens, I think. This one is called, it's wet and wild and it's called um, Pinch Me Pink. You can see that right there without the glare. Pinch Me Pink is the one that I like uh, for doing the faces. Sorry, I'm just right in front of a window and it just wants to catch that glare. So obviously you could use whatever kind you want. And I usually have a, a little Q-tip to apply the blush to the faces. All right. Now don't feel like you need to get all this stuff when you get started. I've purchased this stuff as I've needed it. Now let's talk about, now let's talk about floss organization. Um, I usually, for the most part, will get these little note cards and I fold them in half and glue them together and then punch holes in them. And that is good for kits that don't have a lot of floss. But if you have to sort a lot of floss, like with a stocking that comes with a lot of colors, I find that these little um, floss organizers, these, uh, I use these also for my cross stitching projects. These are made by Loran and they have uh, two different kind. These are the master cards. I think they have project cards. They also come with a magnet that holds your needle, but these are fine too. So you can see how you just loop your floss on there and um, organize it and you can put the number of the floss that they have. So lots of different ways. You can buy some custom ones at um, on Etsy. And I think Mary Stockings has some really cute ones made out of wood that have cute little sayings on them. Something like, uh, I, I, 
stitch past my bedtime or something really cute like that. So lots of options for organizing your floss. So anything you can find to do that. Uh, let's talk about scissors. So I keep my scissors in just one of these bags. You can go, you can buy these by bulk uh, on Amazon or any kind of a little bag. But I, I find that having a, a variety of scissors has helped with my crafting. So number one, the, my favorite scissors to use for cutting out felt are these by, these are Fiskars and they're spring loaded. And I'll put a link for this stuff below. So all this stuff that I talk about, I'm going to put, I have a, it's called an Amazon Associates page where I can link my favorite products. And when you click on the link to go to Amazon to buy them, I get a tiny little bit of commission. We're talking like part of a cup of coffee or something. But it's kind of nice because when you click on the link, it doesn't cost you any extra. But when you go to Amazon, actually anything you buy on Amazon, it doesn't even have to be what you initially went there for. I get a little bit of a kickback for that. So it's kind of cool. It's just a, a little subtle uh, way to support my channel if you like. And I will try to link all of these things below. But you don't need to get these on Amazon. You can obviously go to Walmart or your favorite craft store. And these are pretty readily available. They're just a spring-loaded pair of scissors and... Uh, they're great. They save your hand. Now, I, I use those, but somebody had recommended a brand of scissors that they love, and the name is escaping me right now. It's a woman's name, and I cannot remember it, but I did buy a small pair, and they are very nice. They're like these little Teflon scissors, and they're super nice. They have, if you listen or look, you can see there's actually sort of ridges on this, on these scissors, that when you uh, cut the felt, it actually grabs the felt and kind of makes it so it's easier to cut. So these are really nice. Um, the pair that I bought, I didn't realize were so small. So I need to get this same brand, but get a bigger pair to try. But I do really love these. And I, when I need to cut out something really tedious, I use those. They come with this nice little sheath as well. Uh, I have a pair of just children's scissors, scissors I don't care about at all because when I need to cut out poster board or cardboard or something that's not felt, you know, that's not my good scissors, then I will use these little cheap children's scissors. Uh, I think that's it. Um, I also like to keep a pair of tweezers because you never know when you're gonna need a pair of tweezers to uh, pick out some stitches when you make a mistake or just, they come in handy for a lot of reasons, a lot of ways. So definitely I like to have a pair of tweezers and then a pencil because a lot of times you have to trace pieces that call for um, a like a cardboard or poster board to be inserted in between them and you need to trace the pieces of felt, then I just use a pencil and then obviously poster board or cardboard. I usually use the cardboard that comes in the kit uh, to cut out those pieces as needed. And I keep these all in a bag. I forgot to mention that I also like to have some thread conditioner on hand and this is called Thread Magic. And it's just, you run your thread through there when it becomes unruly, <laughs> as it sometimes does in these kits. And so it's nice to have some thread magic on hand to condition your thread. Actually, I found two things that I want to talk about that I highly recommend getting is a bottle of this Fray Check, uh, which is kind of like clear glue. And I have found that this has come in handy for quite a few things uh, when you get something that frays or when you're working on something maybe, uh, like when you're working on something that needs to have extra stability or maybe around the knot or something and you don't want the knot to come undone, um, you can put a little bit of this fray check at the uh, on top of the knot. I, I've used it for something else and I can't remember, but it comes in handy. So I would highly recommend, it's not very expensive and I think you can buy it even in a pack of two, but this one bottle will last you forever. So yep, it's called fray check and it's like instant drying it's like super glue kind of in a way. So whatever you would use super glue for, that's what you would use it for. And then, this isn't an absolutely necessary tool, but I already had it on hand. It is called a Krynic Quarter. And if you go to Vanna's tutorial, um, where she shows how to make the twisted cord, she uses this tool. And it, think of it kind of like a fishing line. It has this little hook that spins. Okay, and because when you make twisted cord, you need to spin your floss. And you can do it using a, just a, like a pin or a pencil. 
um, and twist it, which is fine, and that does work, but if you can get yourself one of these, it makes making your own cording so much easier, and you will see because Bonna showed you how to use this. So not 100% necessary tool, but a fun one to have, and yes, like I said, I already had it on hand because I made twisted cording for my cross-stitch projects. Okay, now originally when I started these kits, I bought a bunch of these little organizers that have the little compartments inside. And I have found that even though they seem like they're, the compartments on them are really steady, uh, if you tip them over, I do think that some can slide over. Some of these containers are made better than others, but I was using these and I do sort of like them for some things, but uh, I have found that I like the uh, individual containers better so even though I do keep sort of the overflow of flaw of the um, sequins sorry sequins in these containers I have since moved on to a different method and I used to also have one thing that was similar to this and I don't think I have it anymore let me see if it's in my no I think I repurposed it for something else but it was one of these that was round and it had like little triangular tabs I throw I show it in an earlier video but it did not stay closed at all. It kept, the lids on it kept popping open. So you gotta be careful to um, when you buy those to make sure that they have a really good snapping lid, which is why I have now changed to the screw-on lid. So let me grab that. Okay, I believe I got this at Joann's, maybe possibly Joann's. I don't remember where I got this, but you know, any craft store that just if you go to their beading section or their jewelry section, You'll find they maybe even have this at Walmart, but it has a lid. Now, the lid doesn't stay on tight, but it's just a place to store these individual containers that screw on. And I absolutely love the fact that there isn't going to be anything spilling out of these if you remember to put the lid on. So I have started using these for my individual sequins. And then what I do, and I'm probably going to need more of them because they're... For the most part, you get the same with working with Bucilla. You get a lot of the same sequins in the kits over and over again. But every once in a while, they're slightly different colors. And I have found that I've used a lot of these. So what I do is when I when I get a kit that I'm working on, I will then grab all of the sequins in that particular kit and put them in the containers like so. I have this little tray. I'll talk about that in a minute. But these containers then are all the ones like the garden in the garden kit that I'm working for now these are all the sequins that come in that kit so I will keep these sort of together as I'm working on the kit and then I know that these are all the sequins that came with that kit now because you, when you do a lot of these kits you start getting a lot of beads with every single kit you start getting a lot of beads the red beads the clear beads and the black beads are usually what you get and a lot of times you get a ton of white sequins as well so I like to use these bigger containers that you can also get at Walmart. And what's cool about them is that they snap together like so. Give them a good tug and they stack. So that's pretty cool. So I like those to uh, when I'm starting to care, you know, collect a lot of the same thing, like the definitely the white sequins, the red beads, and um probably have a lot of black beads too but definitely these two beads and the white sequins I get a lot of if you start doing a lot of these kits not necessary but I got this little tray at the Dollar Tree I was just in there one day and I thought oh that kind of looks like a neat little place where I can dump sequins out when I'm working so I'll put like some beads in here sometimes I'll just dump the beads out in a lid and then dump some sequins in the tray here and just work on it and it's really nice because um, it just sort of contains them all and allows you to just you know work on a few at a time um, and because I have my camera set up for really close work right now I I can't show you my big container that I stored in so I'm gonna take my camera off the tripod and just show you when I'm working on a kit what I do and also where I keep all this stuff stored when I'm not working on it so I will flip you around and show you that right now Okay, so I have this also a little toolbox here that I bought. It's a crafting toolbox that I bought at Walmart. And this is where I keep most of the stuff stored in when I'm not using it. I used to just keep this next to me when I was working on my kits, but then I have another method that I do. But I did want to show you just like when 
if I need a certain tool, then I'll come here to get it so it opens up into this tier. So I do have some uh, needle threaders and I keep my extra needles in there, but this is where I keep all my uh, tools for stuffing, or extra ones anyway. Uh, there's another set of tweezers there. Um, pin cushion, some extra floss, my fray check. This is kind of the stuff I showed you down below. So this is my little bag that has the tweezers and scissors in it that I will actually put in with the kit that I'm working with at the time. But these are just where I keep just all the extra stuff stored, you know, the chenille stems, because you don't always need those in every kit, and the extra beads and, and stuff like that. So that's where I keep that off to the side, and it's just nice and convenient. And can be a nice little carrying handle there to uh, move it around the house if you need to. Okay, and then I have these big bags that I use to store my kits that I have started but I'm not currently working on anymore or at the at the time so I like my Valentine kit so let me unzip this and show you so you can see that's where I keep all of the pieces and parts for the in progress Valentine kit and then when I pull it out to work on it I'll show you what I like to do with the actual product projects that I'm working on at the current moment. It's my favorite method so far. So let me grab the third and final storage container. And this is what it is. It's one of those containers that you can buy in the scrapbooking section at your craft store because it's meant to hold like the 12 by 12 sheets of paper. And I happened to get this one at the dollar store. Uh, it wasn't a dollar, it was like, I think $5. So it's a little bit, um, inexpensive quality but it, it does the trick though and I like it because you can put the kit that's inside you can kind of put the little container right on top and then when I open it up it has in it then the I like it because it kind of almost has a little opening you know you can kind of use the lid to set things on and you have a, like a little workspace there so I'll just put this on the couch next to me and keep you know the then I have the instructions there and then the way that I further organize it, which I did also forget to mention that it's very helpful to have Ziploc bags. So I usually will have one Ziploc bag that has all the little Ziploc bags inside of it for the different pieces and parts to organize what I'm working on. But I like that because it just kind of stores, you can kind of keep that in there. I have a little bit of polyfill with one of my little, the little stick that I like to use to stuff. I'll keep that with me for just little pieces and parts that I need to stuff. And then I have my tray in there with the sequins that come with that particular kit. My little floss organizers. Um, now these are some free floss organizers I got somewhere. Uh, these are really nice ones. Uh, I don't know. I can't remember where I got those. But anyway, um, keep that in the kit too. And then at the bottom down there I have some poster board just in case I need some poster board. And then I will also put in my little pack of scissors and those little tools that I need. And then that's usually everything I need for the current project I'm working on. And it makes it just a little bit easier to take it on the go when I want to... I don't usually take it anywhere outside of my house, but say, for instance, in the evening if I want to work upstairs or, you know, in the morning I come downstairs, I can just grab this little container and take it with me and move it around the house. So that is what I use right now in July 2023. Um, it's as I find new tools and different organization systems, uh, I kind of switch it up. But right now, this seems to be working for me and I'd love to hear what you use. And if you are just kind of wondering what you need to get started, I hope this gives you an idea of what I like to use. And that's it for now. Okay, I hope you've enjoyed this video, and I'm going to go ahead and get it edited and uploaded for you to refer back to as needed. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now. Spot, I find that to be, ooh, what's, what do we got going on here? Look at that. I got caught up on something. Ooh. Now I got a loose stitch. Hey, you know what? This is an opportunity to show you how I would fix that because that's really annoying. So this is how I would fix that. Is I would get, hmm, how would I fix that? 
I think what I will do do is I think I'm just going to make a loop like this. So I kind of hooked a, a loop of thread on there. I think what I'm going to do is just, I'm going to hide it under this pink. Just going to pull it like that under that pink. And um, I'm not really going to stabilize it because I just don't think it's going anywhere. I just needed to hide the fact that it was a loop. So I think I'm just going to then go back down again come out the back and trim it like that. There, nobody will know that it was there. So, oh, crisis averted.